Let's go. Put it again. Put it again. Put it again. Okay, hey, the number one word today again is hustle. Hit. Hustle and hit all the way. Now, it is a game of hustle and hit, man against man. It is a game of power against power, and of power directed toward any detectable weakness in the opposition. It is a game of precision moves designed to unsettle the most imperturbable of opponents. It is a game of thoughtful deliberation calculated to outwit the cleverest of adversaries. A game of power, of precision, of deliberation. It is a game for everyone on a Sunday afternoon in autumn. Here we go. Let's go. Ready? Four, three, Frank. Let's go now, everybody. Come on, gang. Come on, gang. Round right. Watch it draw. Get ready. Get ready. Yes, yes. Hut, three, Frank. Come on. All right, let's go now. Big down, big down. Speed is not an exclusive property of the Cowboys. The Steelers have their share with such young speed demons as halfback Don Shy. And of course, there's swift flanker Roy Jefferson. A threat to score at any time from anywhere on the field. Speed is equally important on defense, as number 20, Paul Martha, demonstrated. Marv Woodson also supplies plenty of speed. So does Bobby Hahn. Quickness to react is important, too. Speed and quickness can sometimes turn defense into offense. Seven times in 1967, defensive back Marv Woodson turned an opponent's pass into Pittsburgh possession. Steeler fans can expect even more speed and turnabout thrills from Woodson and his teammates in the coming year. Another 1968 opponent will be the Fran Tarkenton-led New York Giants. Their trademark, excitement. The Steelers, too, will be exciting. There will again be the darting moves of a downfield receiver. There will be fingertip touchdowns. There will be the crunching impact, which follows an open field reception. be the flashing image of an all-out tear into enemy territory. There will be the ever-popular deception of the old in-around play. the slashing style of a rampaging fullback. While the excitement is not always caused by strictly legal maneuvers, it is nonetheless excitement. Rival quarterbacks sometimes wish more maneuvers were illegal. Next season, the Steelers will be bringing even more of their own brand of excitement. Another opponent will be the Philadelphia Eagles, grounded last season by crippling injuries. In a game of power and hitting, 
injuries do occur. Last year, the Steelers, like the Eagles, suffered more than their share of disabling injuries. The defensive team sorely missed one of the league's best when it lost defensive end Ben McGee. The offensive team lost important men too, men like quarterback Bill Nelson, fullback Earl Grove, and tight end John Hilton. These and a variety of other injuries hurt the Steelers last season. Coach Bill Austin and Pittsburgh fans hope that the many Steelers who were limping in 67 will be running at the opposition again in 68. schedule will be the Washington Redskins. The dying clock and the forward pass characterize their style of play. With only 32 seconds remaining in last year's Pittsburgh-Dallas game, Dallas used the pass to slip by the Steelers in a bruising uphill struggle. Given time, the Steelers, too, know how to move the ball through the air. can look forward to more passing thrills in the coming season. In 1968, the Steelers will also be up against the teams of the Coastal Division. The champions are the Los Angeles Rams, losers of only two games during all of last season. In the midst of the glamour and glory of Hollywood, the Rams have gained their own kind of glamour and glory. Much of the acclaim goes to the fearsome defensive line, led by the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year in 1967, David Deacon Jones. The Steelers have long been known for their own rock rib defensive lines, and next year will be no exception, with such returning stalwarts as number 60 defensive end Ben McGee. And Lloyd Voss. Along with 280-pound tackle Ken Cordes. And number 64, Chuck Hinton. The Steeler defense will once again be hustling, hitting, and swarming all over the opposition. will also meet the Baltimore Colts, led by the masterful strategy and passing precision of John Unitas. Strategy and precision are major allies of any NFL team. Often the oldest plays in the book are among the best, for instance, the bootleg. Or the halfback option pass is executed by Dick Hope. Precision is an accurate center snap, a quick spin of the laces to the front, and a perfect arc by the foot of the kicker. Dick Hope knows a variation of this play. Chet Anderson makes sure the strategy pays off. The onside kick is an old trick, which usually results in good field position for the kicking team.
score or good field position for the receiving team. Strategy and precision combine as good blocking opens the way to another Steelers score. And there will be many more in the new season. Also representing the Coastal Division against the Steelers next season will be the rejuvenated San Francisco 49ers. Their stock in trade is hitting. In the violent world of pro football, the Steelers have always held their own. And then some. quarterbacks can expect no let up in the coming season. The Atlanta Falcons are also on the Steelers schedule. In the past, the Falcons soared mainly before the game. During Atlanta's games, the football often changed hands with startling suddenness. In pro football, no team is immune to the fact that the football sometimes seems to have a mind of its own. assume that the ball will continue to bounce as it pleases during the new season. This year, Pittsburgh will twice meet each century division team, including the St. Louis Cardinals with their gambling defense, featuring the Blitz. All right, here we go. Swarm dog with a twist. Whichever one. You got the twist? Huh? Get what you want. Let's go, big down, gang. You have a brown right. Watch your draw. Number 50 is Bill Saul. He directs the Steelers' defense, including the Blitz. Saul can send any of several devastating Blitzers, such as number 28, safety man Clendon Thomas. number 53, linebacker John Campbell. Or number 20, safety man Paul Martha. Off 
Hoffman, Saul himself will clean up after the play. Or stop the play before it can start. Whether it's left linebacker Campbell, middle linebacker Saul, or right linebacker Andy Russell, number 34, the Steelers will continue to come up with the big defensive play when it's most needed. New Orleans is the home of the Saints, the youngest team in the NFL. In the coming year, the Steelers will welcome the youthful and promising Saints to the Century Division. Youth is also on the side of the Steelers, with such bright young stars as number 10, Kent Nix, the quarterback from TCU. And number 86, J.R. Wilburn, the split end from South Carolina. In their first year together, this combination moved the ball against some of the NFL's best. looks bright for Kent Nix and J.R. Wilburn. This season, the Steelers will again face the Century Division champions, the Cleveland Browns. Their byword is power. Their favorite weapon, the power sweep, escorted by a cordon of blockers. In Pittsburgh, also, power is a byword. Behind such blockers is John Brown, Larry Gagner, Ray Mansfield, Bruce Van Dyke, and Mike Haggerty. Steeler runners will often find good gains. And touchdowns. Sometimes the ball carrier will unleash his own extra burst of power. For Bill Austin Steelers, 1967 was a year of big downs. It all started in Pitt Stadium on September 17th, before the largest opening day crowd in Steeler history. The opponents were the Chicago Bears, one of whom wore number 40. Gail Sayers' 103-yard run had put the Bears ahead early in the game. It had also gone into the records as the longest scoring play in Bears history. Three minutes later, the Bears had returned an interception for another touchdown. Behind 13-3, the Steeler defense fought back. Marv Woodson got the ball rolling in the right direction. Quarterback Bill Nelson wasted little time getting the ball to tight end John Hilton. John Hilton wasted little time getting the first Steeler touchdown of 1967. In the second quarter, the Steelers were moving again as Cannonball Butler cannonballed through the Bears' defense. 
Bill Nelson kept the drive moving with a pass to split end Dick Compton. Fullback Bill Asbury climaxed the drive as he stepped into the end zone to put the Steelers in the lead. In the third quarter, it was Asbury again. This time he gained, in one play, more than four times what Chicago's running attack could manage all afternoon. This was also the longest run from scrimmage in the NFL's entire 1967 season. It was then a relatively simple matter to add another touchdown. The Bears' troubles and the Steelers' defense were not through yet. Marv Woodson came up with a new opportunity in Chicago territory. The Bears blitzed, but Bill Nelson and Dick Compton had the perfect remedy. Bill Nelson called on Asbury to get more tough yards and more points. In the fourth quarter, the Steelers continued to dominate all phases of the game. On an end-around play, flanker Roy Jefferson high-stepped all the way to the Chicago seven-yard line. From there, behind solid protection, Nelson fired to the slamming Dick Compton to complete a 41-13 route of the Bears. The Chicago Bears and the Pittsburgh Steelers have waged gridiron war since 1934. In those 33 years, the Steelers have tasted victory but once. In their initial 1967 encounter, played before the Steelers' largest opening day crowd ever, the Steelers' defense told a new story. With the Bears trailing three to nothing early in the first period, Gail Sayers received three yards deep in his own end zone. His blazing 103-yard gallop not only thrust the Bears into the lead, but also went down as the longest scoring play in Bears history. Sayers' electrifying epic inspired the Bear defense. Number 24, Rosie Taylor picked off an attempted pass and scored Chicago's second touchdown in three minutes. Another Chicago moment of glory was short-lived. Despite the all-pro heroics of Sayers, the Bears could not generate any offensive momentum. Coach George Hallis knows that Sayers can't do it alone. The pregame shakes apparently gone. The Steelers go to work with number 23, Cannonball Butler. Number 14, Bill Nelson. Next selects fullback Bill Asbury on a short swing. Asbury's gain sets up the second Steelers field goal and the Bears lead is lessened as evidenced by the Steelers' enthusiasm. Pursued by the Steeler rush, Bears quarterback Larry Rakestraw overthrows his mark. And number 47, Marv Woodson is there to set up the first Steeler touchdown of the new season. Bill Nelson wastes little time in delivering a strike to number 82, tight end John Hilton. Hilton outmuscles the Bears defenders and goes in for the score.
The Steelers are on the move again in the second quarter as they continue to dominate play. Cannonball Butler. Number 45, Dick Compton. Number 36, Charlie Bivens. And John Hilton, keep the attack moving. Bill Asbury does the honors at the goal line and climaxes the drive with a six point run. It's Asbury again in the third quarter. On this 73 yard run, Asbury gained more than four times what Chicago runners could muster all day. Two plays later, former Bear, Charlie Bivens, vaulted for six more as the Steelers increased their margin. The Bears ran into more trouble and the Steelers more points. Mike Clark toes a field goal to increase the Steelers' lead. Reading a Chicago blitz, Nelson tosses one into the outstretched arms of number 45, Dick Compton, for 32 yards. Bill Asbury takes it in for his second touchdown of the day. In the fourth quarter, the scene is the same, only the names are changed. First, it's Charlie Bivens over the middle with the Nelson aerial for 24 yards. The end around with flanker Roy Jefferson, number 87, takes the ball to the seven. From there, behind a solid wall of protectors, Nelson spears Dick Compton on a slant end to cap a smashing 41-13 victory by Pittsburgh. Nelson only completed eight of 25 attempts, but when he was on, there was a real sting. The longest gain of the day was this 48-yarder coming off the play action. Number 46, Chester Anderson, was also the game's leading receiver. Anderson is 6'3 and 245 pounds, a good target under any circumstances. A rookie quarterback is especially susceptible to a long, hard rush, and that's what breeds interceptions. Goal line yardage has become the private domain of Willie Asbury. It takes three tries to move the rugged Cardinal line. With the touchdown, the score stands Steelers 14, Cardinals 19. In the closing minutes, the Steelers come on gamely, running their two-minute drill. The cards are giving up the short ones without giving up any pressure on the quarterback.
Kent Nix takes over for the last shot at a score. Both room and time run out simultaneously. The final score will stand. Pittsburgh 14, St. Louis 28. Bill Austin Steelers closed out their 1967 season with a flight to Titletown, USA, known elsewhere as Green Bay, Wisconsin. The Steelers, in fact 15 of the 16 teams in the NFL, traveled by United Airlines. Going into the final game, the Packers had already convincingly wrapped up the Central Division Championship. They were now determined to bounce back after having been edged the previous week on a last-minute block punt in Los Angeles. The Steelers were equally determined to close out their season with an upset victory. Despite Ben Hawkins, the Steelers made a game of it. With a battle less than four minutes old, Bill Asbury thundered 25 yards for the Steelers' first score. Young Steeler quarterback Kent Nix, starting his first NFL game, shows poise as he nails Bill Asbury down the middle. This sets up number 42, Dick Hope, for the tally as the Steelers pull within three at 17 to 14. Early in the third period, number 23, Cannonball Butler, runs over people to set up Mike Clark's first field goal of the day. Eagles 24, Steelers 17. The Steelers continue to dominate the third period. Number 45, Dick Compton, slips into the middle and strides out with the day's longest game. Early in the fourth period, number 42, Dick Hope, finds Bill Asbury. Asbury runs to the Eagle 14. From there, it's a circus catch by number 82, J.R. Wilburn, as the Steelers tie it up 24 all. The remedy, Ben Hawkins. This dazzling 41-yard return sets up the Hawks' second touchdown of the day as the Eagles soar 31-24. It's more of the same late in the period. Hawkins latches onto this 24-yarder to bring his day's receiving total to 187 yards, most this season for any Eagle. Sam Baker adds three points of insurance, and time runs out on the Steelers as the Eagles win 34-24 and go into a tie for first place in the tight capital division. Minor injuries. As expected, the first quarter was dominated by defense. Marv Woodson picks off Ryan's pass. The Pittsburgh offense is stymied by a grudging Cleveland defense. The Steelers have to settle for a 43-yard field goal attempt. Mike Clark's shot is good, and Pittsburgh has a 3-0 advantage. The Browns' defense is hot and comes up with the ball almost immediately. The Steeler defense won't be overshadowed, though. Marv Woodson pulls off his second interception. If Kent Nix can beat the clock, the Steelers will have the halftime advantage. Pittsburgh penetrates to the Browns 13, but Cleveland leads 7-3 at the break. The 
rookie Kent Nix rolled up 208 yards passing. 13 on this square out to Dick Compton. Nix comes back with a heady call. John Hilton on the end around. The drive's capped when Nix finds Dick Hope running clear on this flare pattern. The Steelers are closing. It's 14 to 10. Ryan has all the time he needs, but it doesn't help. Andy Russell returns 42 yards. With five seconds remaining, the Steelers are still going for it. Ross Feetner drops the curtain on the final play. The score, Browns 21, Steelers 10. With this win, the Cleveland Browns are in striking distance of this week's opponent, the division-leading St. Louis Cardinals. The Giants get the ball again, but are forced to punt. A bad snap gives the Steelers possession on the Giant 12. Cannonball Butler goes 20 yards sideways and ends up with no gain. It's third and one on the one. Kent Nix scores the first Steeler touchdown and it's seven all at the end of the first quarter. But the punt is fumbled and Pittsburgh retains the ball deep in giant territory. Number 25, setback Don Shy is having his finest day as a pro. He takes a swing pass from Nix and high steps it in for the score. Pittsburgh leads by seven, 14 to seven. With less than a minute to go in the half, the Steelers try to put more points on the board. Nix hits number 45, Dick Compton, and he gallops into giant territory. Clark's field goal gives the Steelers a lead at halftime, 17-14. In the third quarter, the Steelers want more. Don Shy looks like an all-pro halfback on this 12-yard scamper. Rookie quarterback Nix appears to be an experienced veteran today. He exhibits a quarterback's greatest asset, poise under pressure, as he finds Hilton with an off-balance touchdown toss. Pittsburgh leads by 10, 24 to 14. The Steelers seem to be on the move once more. But Don Shy's dream game comes to an abrupt halt when he fumbles on this crucial play to give the Giants possession and one last chance. With Tarkenton at the helm, anything can happen. And today it does. It's a triple reverse, leaving Joe Morrison all alone again, this time to score the winning touchdown. The Giants stage a thrilling fourth quarter comeback and are now tied for first in the century division. Against Pittsburgh, the Cowboys again alternated Craig Morton and Jerry Rome at quarterback. 
For both young men, it would be a long and painful afternoon. A win at Pitt Stadium is never without its bruising remembrances. At times, Craig Morton was sought out and destroyed. But when victory hung in the balance, it was he who inflicted the most destructive blow. For three periods, the determined Steelers sensed an upset. Then, suddenly, they struck for a late fourth quarter touchdown that gave them a 21-17 lead with just a minute to play. With Dallas 78 yards from the Steeler goal, a funny thing happened on the way to an upset. Craig Morton, on a rollout option, threw to Lance Renzel, who made the catch, but then fumbled. Trailing the play was Dan Reeves, who alertly recovered the loose ball on the Steelers' six. With 32 seconds to play, the bench stood unbelieving. Forced from the pocket, Morton scrambled until he found Pettis Norman free for the touchdown. It didn't seem possible, but the Cowboys had found a brand new way to win a game in the last second. For three weeks, Dallas had tantalized opponents by giving them a taste of victory, only to snatch it away in the waning moments. It is difficult competing as the youngest in any field. But for the New Orleans Saints, 1967 has been particularly tough. They have been so frustratingly close to their first NFL victory that it seems that the win has to be just around the corner. Victories are won by inches and seconds and lots of good fortune. The Saints haven't had much of either this year. But the Pittsburgh Steelers have had injury problems this season and the Saints were hoping that this would be their game. Late in the first half, linebacker Jackie Burkett picked off a possible Steeler touchdown. The Saints had kicked a first quarter field goal, so with a score now, they could go into the locker room with a 10 to nothing halftime lead. Number 15, Gary Quazzo, hit Jim Taylor over the middle, and number 31 showed he hasn't mellowed even a little bit. Quazzo then passed 30 yards to Tom Barrington, who stopped the clock. With 30 seconds left in the half, rookie split end Dan Abramowitz made the type of catch he's becoming known for. In this game, he caught 12 passes for 156 yards. As the first half ended, Jim Taylor gave 69,000 New Orleans fans added reason to believe that this might be their game. The 10 to nothing Saint lead held through the third quarter. The Steelers mounted two long drives, but both times they were ended by the New Orleans defense. The little O, Obert Logan, ended the first drive and returned it to the 20. Dave Whitzel ended the second drive with a spectacular goal line interception.
Jim Taylor punished his way for short yardage. But the Steelers came up with great defense too, as 10-year veteran Clendon Thomas set the stage for an entire Pittsburgh Steeler fourth quarter. The score was still 10 to nothing in the fourth quarter, but Cannonball Butler and the Steelers aimed to change all of that. Just off the injury list, fullback Earl Grow picked up 15 more yards. Next, it was J.R. Wilburn's turn. Number 14 belongs to Bill Nelson, who hasn't played since the second game of the season. Touchdown, J.R. Wilburn. An end zone camera showed how a fine fullback fake pulled the defense over and left the middle wide open for Wilburn. The Saints lead is now just three points. Nelson is at quarterback for the Steelers, but the winning drive was owned solely by rookie halfback Don Shy, number 25. He was a nationally known decathlon star at San Diego State last year. Today, with two minutes left in the game, he was the reason for victory. The Saints would have to wait for that first win. The Cleveland Browns, a team which is gathering momentum, and the Pittsburgh Steelers, a snake-bitten club for much of the season, come to grips at Pitt Stadium. For Pittsburgh, the tenor of the game is established on the first scrimmage play. It is to be an afternoon of frustration. Breaks have a way of evening out, and when a Gary Collins fumble is recovered by Clendon Thomas, the Steelers breathe easier. The bootlegging Nelson throws to his tight end, John Hilton, to give the Steelers their first bona fide scoring threat of the game. The threat fast becomes a fact as Nelson and Roy Jefferson, both recently off the injured list, combine to give Pittsburgh seven points. Bill Nelson engineers the longest play of the day as he passes to Don Shaw. The San Diego State rookie sprints 55 yards to give Steeler fans a chance to cheer. Nelson, on a sprint out right, throws to J.R. Wilburn, who gives E. Rich Barnes a good pop at the Cleveland 13. This time, Nelson sprints out to the left while looking for Wilburn again. Pittsburgh finally gets a break, but it's too late to help. Wilburn's touchdown makes the final score 34-14 as Cleveland continues to hold a share of first place in the Century Division. At the end of the first quarter, the scoreboard reflects the traditional defensive back. At the outset of the second quarter, 
Bill Nelson catches St. Louis in a blitz. J.R. Wilburn goes for 49 yards before Jimmy Burson can recover. Don Shy cracks over from the four. Pittsburgh seven, St. Louis nothing. The Steelers blitz is picked up, but it rattles Jim Hart, and the implications are felt downfield. Paul Martha intercepts and returns 23 yards. The Cardinals defense holds, and Mike Clark attempts a 27-yard field goal. He shanks it. And St. Louis takes over with no loss of points. Prentice God on the draw threads his way for 14 yards. The Steelers blitz again, including a safety. The Pittsburgh rotation fails to pick up Jackie Smith quickly enough. Johnny Rowland vaults over for the touchdown. When the half ends, it is Pittsburgh 7, St. Louis 7. The third quarter is a reversion to first quarter form. Scoreless defense. The last quarter begins in the established pattern. Then a pattern peculiar to the Steelers takes over. Unfortunate mistakes. A touchdown is nullified by an offsides penalty. cards take their second chance and force Pittsburgh to kick from deep in their end zone. Jim Elliott's timing goes amok and his punt is dead on the Pittsburgh 23. In a few nightmarish moments, a Steeler touchdown is converted to sure striking distance for the Cardinals. Hart rolls around the Steelers' rush. Jackie Smith's man has slipped, and he's all alone. The Cards take a seven-point lead. With two minutes on the clock, the Steelers launch a drive. The goal is 90 yards away, and the Cardinals are in a prevent defense. A prevent defense means five defensive halfbacks and a three-man rush. The prevent is designed to yield the short passes, but shut off the bomb. The combination of time to throw and a defensive secondary overconscious of the deep threat allow the Steeler receiver to eat up the medium yardage. With 24 seconds remaining, a desperate Cardinal defense blitzes. It's not enough. Roy Jefferson has beaten his man and the score is tied. The Cardinals have one last chance at a win. Jim Bakken will try a 49-yard attempt. 
After kicking field goals in the last 19 games, Jim Bakken's streak is ended. And the final is St. Louis 14, Pittsburgh 14. The second meeting of the season between these two Century Division teams turned out to be as rough and tumble as the first when the Giants won on a 59-yard triple reverse flea flicker. Today, there would be no magic needed, however. Number 14, Bill Nelson, is healthy again. With the game less than four minutes old, all eyes are on Mike Clark's three-point effort. It's good, and the Steelers lead three to nothing. The Steelers' defense stopped the Giants cold in the first period. The result was more offensive opportunities. Bill Asbury blocks and rookie Don Shy penetrates for six up the middle. Conscious of the run, the Giant defenders are loose for a slant in. Bill Nelson and Roy Jefferson oblige. Play action faking and picture perfect blocking gives Nelson plenty of time to spear split end Dick Compton at the 20. The protection continues and so does the passing. Four defenders can't separate Compton from the ball and it's first and goal at the seven. Funny thing happened on the way to the touchdown. The Giants got stingy inside the five and forced the Steelers to go for three. Mike Clark salvaged the field goal. Steelers six, Giants nothing. Bill Nelson hits Dick Compton over the middle for 20. Bill Nelson goes up top and lofts a bomb to number 87, Roy Jefferson. Rocket Roy high steps past his desperate defender to bring the Steelers within one point, 14 to 13. Randy Manier heard that the Steelers' defense against the run was tough. Now he knows for certain. Feeling is believing. Having beaten themselves in more curious ways than seemingly possible, Pittsburgh concentrates its efforts on beating the Giants. Using play action, Nelson freezes the Giants secondary long enough to free John Hilton for a good game. But a holding penalty costs them 15 yards. Tarkenton scrambles and scrambles.
running both himself and his receivers dizzy, Fran unloads a bomb to Joe Morrison, who is double teamed. Paul Martha makes a spectacular interception as the third quarter ends with the Giants up 28-13. Number 75, Jim Cat Cavage beats his man and forces Nelson to abandon the pocket. Finding no other recourse than to run, Nelson sprints down the sideline for a first down. Even a small success dazes the Steelers. Dick Compton has beaten his man on a fly pattern, but drops the perfectly thrown bomb. Nelson recoups five yards with a strike to Hilton. Follow number 42, Dick Hope, who swings out of the backfield. Nelson hits him with a precision pass. Hope shrugs off Wendell Harris and moves into giant territory. Disdaining the short pass, Nelson tries to bomb New York again. This time his pass to J.R. Wilburn is on target, but Clarence Childs has called for interference on the 10-yard line. Nelson hits Hilton on a quick look in, and Pittsburgh has reduced the giant margin to eight. Reviewing the TD, we see that the Giants are caught by surprise. Number 81, Freeman White's attempted clothesline tackle is too late to stop Hilton. Giants 28, Steelers 20. Throwing off balance, Tarkenton's pass is intercepted by Bob Hahn, whose momentum carries him into the end zone. With time and victory a fleeting memory, Pittsburgh must start its drive at the two. Buffeted by a fierce rush, Nelson is dropped in the end zone. But this time, it is the Steelers who are saved by a face mask penalty. Pittsburgh claws out of trouble as Dick Hoke on an option pass follows number 79, Larry Gagner, to a first down. The Giants rush four men, and Nelson has time to connect with Jefferson. The drive is halted momentarily by Vince Costello, who neatly breaks up Nelson's pass to Jefferson. Pittsburgh reaches their 40 on a swing pass to fullback Earl Grove. Nelson saturates the Giants with swing passes to his setbacks, and New York must readjust their defense.
But even a blitz doesn't help as Nelson passes to Shy at the Giants' 25. The last play pass was completed for two reasons. Though forced from the pocket, Nelson threw a perfect pass on the run between two defenders. And Shy made a brilliant catch. But victory was not to be the Steelers' destiny. As it was in the beginning, so was it at the end. Steeler mistakes cost them another game. Too many penalties, too many dropped passes gave the New York Giants their 28-20 victory. The Giants' triumph solidified the Steelers' grasp on last place and placed New York only a game behind the Cleveland Browns in the Century Division. Onside kicks drop punts, and freak interceptions are but a few of them. Neither team could maintain possession of one very important item, the football. It was one of the game's six interceptions that set up the first touchdown. Steelers defensive back, Clendon Thomas, number 28, picked off a Joe Cap pass early in the first quarter. The Steelers couldn't move the ball, however, so they went for an obvious field goal. Or did they? In this game, you just couldn't expect the obvious, as holder Dick Hoke passed to Chet Anderson, who barreled in for Pittsburgh's first score. 7-0 Steelers. Late in the first half, the Steelers struggled to maintain the lead. Halfback Don Shy, number 25, raced for a 25-yard gain. Wild football carnival continued in the second half. Trailing by four points, Bill Nelson threw a strike to Roy Jefferson at the goal line. The Steelers had regained the lead, 20-17. From the lower corner charged Ray May, a rookie from Southern Cal. And the wildest contest of the year ended with a Steeler touchdown but a Minnesota victory, 41-27. Lambeau Field was muddy and treacherous as the Steelers prepared to put all the parts together for a season-ending total effort against the perennial world champion Green Bay Packers. From the outset, both teams had difficulty holding on to the slippery football. In the second quarter, the Steelers shot into a 14-3 lead, thanks mainly to the powerful running of number 38, Earl Grove. Number 23 is super rookie Travis Williams. He accounted for 70 yards in only two plays as Green Bay came roaring back just before halftime. In 
the second half, Andy Russell got the Steeler defense started on the right foot. Bobby Hahn's bone-rattling hit, Bill Saul's fumble recovery, and Mike Clark's field goal widened the Steelers' lead midway through the third quarter. Soon, Pittsburgh was moving again as Kent Nix made connections at the Packer 35, but the ball popped free. Travis Williams hung on to the ball, but Bill Saul made sure his journey was short. The game's key play came when Andy Russell blitzed Zeke Bratkowski. Chuck Hinton grabbed the elusive pigskin and rumbled toward the Green Bay goal. Pittsburgh 24, Green Bay 10. In the fourth quarter, Green Bay rallied valiantly, but as the damp and chilling darkness closed in on Lambeau Field, time ran out on the Packers. The Steelers had overpowered the best team in football. The experts thought it would be just a warm-up for next week's Western title game as Green Bay took on the lowly Steelers. But those proverbial experts would be wrong again. Pittsburgh was aided by a muddy, slippery field which helped cause seven Packer fumbles and three Steeler interceptions. Their defense did the rest, holding Green Bay's awesome ground game to under 100 yards. Of course, the Steelers also had their troubles with the turf. After a Steeler touchdown made it 7-0, Bart Starr tried to bring Green Bay back. Even when he did find his receivers, the footing was so treacherous that long gains were few and far between. Starr's second toss to Donnie Anderson resulted in Green Bay's fourth fumble of the period, but Ben Wilson recovered to continue the drive as the first quarter ended. Lombardi put rookie Don Horn at the helm in the second period. Horn showed his credentials on the first play, a quick toss to tight end Mar Fleming. The drive stalled, but Don Chandler's three-pointer made it 7-3 Pittsburgh midway through the quarter. The Steelers widened their lead on the next series thanks to the legs of number 38, Earl Grove, who gave one of his better performances today with 61 yards rushing against the NFL's top defense. His barreling 22-yard touchdown run made it 14-3 with about two minutes left in the half. With the help of Travis Williams' 40-yard kickoff return, quarterback Horn took a lesson from Bart Starr and guided the pack to a score. Williams, along with Horn, is another of Coach Lombardi's sleeper draft picks. The rookie speedster garnered 250 yards total offense today, 29 of them on this swing pass from Horn that went for a touchdown and narrowed the score to 14 to 10 at the half. The Steeler defense was the story in the second half. A flying tackle by number 34, Andy Russell, started them off. 
Setback Ben Wilson had a rough day on the field. A jolting hit knocked the ball loose, and the Steelers recovered, setting up a 27-yard field goal, which made it 17-10 Steelers midway through the quarter. The Steelers had fumbleitis too. Kent Nix hit his favorite target, J.R. Wilburn, but J.R. couldn't hold the ball, and Bob Jeter's recovery gave the Packers good field position. Travis Williams hung out of the ball, but that was about all. However, it seemed like neither team wanted the pigskin today. The key play of the game came when the Packers' third quarterback, Zeke Bratkowski, lost the ball. Steeler tackled Chuck Hinton, picked it up, and rumbled 27 yards to a touchdown. Lombardi put Horn back in, and the rookie from San Diego State came through again for his coach. Travis Williams sparked this drive. With the help of good blocking, number 23 swept the left side for seven yards. Williams has the speed to become one of the great ones in the NFL. Here he swept right and beat the secondary into the end zone for his second TD of the day. Seven points down, the Packers got one last chance late in the game when Jeter intercepted a Kentnick's pass with less than two minutes to go. A costly penalty nullified Horn's aerial to Max McGee, and he'd have to try again. But the Steelers had nothing to lose today, and they played it loose and tough. Time ran out on Horn and the Packers, despite this last completion. However, Don Horn showed great points, and Lombardi's worries for the future should be minimal. But not for this week, when the Packers meet the Rams for the Western Crown. On that dreary but shining day in Green Bay, the Steelers had at last put all the parts together. Defense doing good. Let's keep it up. Let's get the ball, Ben. Chuck. Kenny. Lloyd. John Bobby. Clinton. Paul Marvin. Andy. Let's go. Let's get up. Soup, baby. Let's get up. 